In 1991, Ali Jamar, a French national, set up the Help Chimpanzee Sanctuary on the edge of the Konkwati Lagoon. Driven by the large numbers of chimpanzees being captured by poachers and being held in captivity, she set out to prove, against all the specialist advice at the time, that it was possible to reintroduce these primates back into the wild. A team of volunteers and local Congolese employees help look after the chimpanzees, at first feeding them daily, then gradually reducing the human contact until they're ready to return to the wild. Over the years, Aliot has managed to release 35 chimpanzees into the heart of the Konkuati forest. A dozen more are being habituated on two islands in the lagoon. Her work has met with a lot of resistance from the local population. When we arrived here, people were convinced it wouldn't last. They've always seen people come, but after a year or two, they left. Now I think they're surprised because I'm still here, in spite of all the harassment. Some local people told us they thought the chimpanzees were being better treated than themselves. Elliot rescued Gina from the zoo in Pointe Noire in 1992. Gina had a baby, but poachers grabbed it. This is a traumatized chimp. She's now so used to humans that it's unlikely she'll ever be able to adapt to the wild. She had a baby. The first one died and the second one was stolen from her. She was a year and a half. The baby was taken from her and since then she's not doing well. Despite the setbacks and the years since the sanctuary was established, the Congolese employees working for Aliette believe attitudes have changed in the area. Félix Batissa came from Pointe Noire in 2001 to work for help. Beforehand, people used to think that chimpanzees, elephants, buffaloes and so on were meat, food for them to eat. Then a while after Madame Jamar arrived, they learned that chimpanzees were not to be eaten. Today, Elliot has all but stopped taking in new chimpanzees, arguing that there's a limit to the numbers that can be sustainably released into any one part of the forest. She's also aware that with no economic alternatives and a strong demand among Africans for bushmeat, even a fully habituated chimpanzee is likely to fall victim to a poacher. The survival of the wildlife will depend on tough conservation measures. Conservation is like having an injection. An injection hurts, but you get over it. The healing process is set to be long. The Congolese government and its African counterparts have yet to come up with a cure which would provide the right balance between sustainable development and conservation. The kind of cooperation must be changed because today the trend is conditional aid. That means that credits are given but they're used to finance experts from donor countries, material from donor countries with very little local added value, with very little local payback and often local populations are excluded. They always end up rebelling and becoming opponents of conservation. Congo and other African governments are at the start of a long process and have a long way to go before they can bring about this change. In part two, we travel to Kenya, where we find that the locals have embraced conservation, but it's bringing problems, its own set of problems. Just go, just go, just go. Um, this are, is one of, one of them is Jimmy, yeah, another one is Kavata, um, the third one I have not identified it. There are more, there are more elephants up there. Mm. 
Yes, they are mares. Yeah, all these are mares. These are the Shimba Hills close to the great port of Mombasa in Kenya. Soon after European colonists arrived just over a century ago, the hills received a measure of protection. In 1968, the newly independent Kenyan government made the area into a national reserve. Today, it's home to the last sable antelopes in Kenya. Elephants, whose local survival was seriously jeopardized when the reserve was created, have recovered to the point where they're becoming a pest. There's a good habitat for them. There is, there's, there's good food, there's, there, there's water, and there's security for them as well. Well, we have some 700 elephants in this area. That's too much. We have for an area of about 250 square kilometers. Um, that is a very high density. According to Kenya Wildlife Service experts, in order to maintain the balance between nature and wildlife, there needs to be at least one square kilometer per elephant. On this estimate, 700 elephants are too many for the 250 square kilometer Shimba Hills Reserve, and too many tuskers are causing problems. The worst animals, elephants. These animals have actually led us to problems for many years. They come, especially when you plant maize, plant cassava, you plant uh, banana trees, they come, they remove them. They spoil them up to everything. They have removed all the, my, my maize crops, have nothing to eat. Now when you go there to try to chase them, they want to follow you up. Now will you compete with an elephant? You run away, you lock yourself in houses. I was told by animals, move. Elephants are very destructive animals. They will kill people, they will injure and maim people. So for the elephant to live with people, it becomes very tricky. So then, to mitigate that, there's need for people living in those areas to benefit from the elephant. When the people see that they are benefiting from the elephant conservation, then they would like to keep, they would like to conserve the elephant. And that's the only way I can see that elephant can cohabit with the people. Only if there is a financial benefit accruing to that. <laughs>